together for the past uh, for for a week and now we are finalizing on our final topic country living after we have dealt with uh, uh, the messages of uh, the final end in fact we we're to focusing on uh, final events and uh, we are truly grateful for what we have covered so far of course all the messages that we have done they've been recorded you can find them on facebook you can find them on youtube um the topic we are doing this afternoon is country living uh, we are not going to be able to exhaust everything about country living but uh i've done some studies on country living and uh it's on our herald report youtube channel i did part one part two part three uh, part three, we're dealing with question and answers. But however, as for this study, because it's a short one, we are going to look at it from a, an angle. And then we are going to focus on the case study of Lot to try and answer the questions about uh, our country living. So as we are going to begin, I'm going to ask you where possible you can kneel with me as I pray. Shall we pray? Loving Father of mercy and compassion, it is always a blessing, O oh Lord, to talk to you, because when we talk to you, you respond. Once more, O oh Lord Jesus, the last prayer of Samson was that you may be with him and you may vindicate him. And Lord, you did not disappoint. And last now, this is our final message for today. As you have led us, O oh Lord Jesus, we pray sincerely for a, for a tremendous power. Most importantly, Lord, to understand this message fully. Lead us, we plead with you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, so, it's uh, the message is about country. The question is, what exactly is country? You know, they are, we, we live in the country. Some, of people, some people live in the country. Some people live in town. The question is, why do people want to live in town? Why do people want to live in the country? But the question is, what exactly does God expect us to? What's the most ideal place to be? We learn from the Bible, from the book of Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. This is actually the beginning as God created humanity. He said in chapters, chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So man is created from the ground, and man, God, breathed into his life. Because uh, God created man, God can actually give us an understanding, a manual on how men should function. Now the question is, where was men to live after God created men? Verse 8, the Bible says, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in, the, in Eden, and, he, and there he put the men whom he had formed. So, the best place for men to be, it's in the countryside. God created men. He planted a vineyard and then he put men in the vineyard. So that goes without saying that the best place to be for, a humanity, for humanity is in the countryside where there are gardens, where there are vineyards or vineyards or where there are orchards or where you can plant things, where you can see things growing. That's where you are supposed to be, produce your own food. This is actually the main lifestyle and the diet. One he will produce his own food living in the garden or living in the countryside. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. God never created gyms. And it's not the ideal, it's not the will of God that we should go to the gym. We are supposed to go and gym in the garden. You know, there are men who have got big muscles. They have got big muscles. But if you give them a, 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 a shovel to go and work, they can't use a shovel. If you give them a hole to go and weed, they can't use a weed. But they have developed big muscles in the gym. Those muscles are useless if they cannot be used to till the ground. Man was put in the garden so that he can dress it. And also, by dressing it, he is exercising to keep himself health, healthy. By being in the garden, he experienced the f he, he breathed fresh air to, to keep his lungs healthy. By being in the garden, he has the sunshine, which actually helps him and also when he drinks water 
he is replenished so for the best for for the sake of our health the garden was the best which god gave us in fact god gave us the best thing now verse 16 says and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat now god did not create chocolates god created fruits vegetables nuts and he gave to humanity and as he did that he said to humanity this is yours enjoy so all if we follow the edenic diet as god gave it the real diet living in the ideal home then we are going to have the optimum health country living page six paragraph five says it was not god's purpose that people should be crowded into cities huddled together in terraces and tenements in the beginning he placed our first parents amid the beautiful sights and sounds he desires us to rejoice in today so it has never been the plan of god that we may be crowded in polohuane or we may be crowded in jobek or we may be crowded in Bari, or we may be crowded wherever we are, be in London, be in New York. God has never planned that men should be crowded in the city. The question is, where did this come from? Remember, in the morning we discussed about the city, Jerusalem. God has created a city, and God wants men to come into his city but the devil because he is an imitator he imitated the city of jerusalem but he decided to do his own city for men which is so detrimental for men's health he said the more nearly we come into harmony with god's original plan the more favorable will be our position to secure health of body and mind and soul so if we follow the plan of god then we will not be able to have the we, we may avoid these problems you know today there is a lot of coronavirus and they are teaching people to do social distancing uh, that's exactly how it was from the beginning there was social distancing people were living in the country and the reason why this coronavirus and they are saying now we should all walk around with masks so that we don't breathe the air which someone is breathing which contain the virus in ourselves but if we go into the countryside we don't need to be wearing masks there's no point because we are well spaced there the air is good there are no even though diseases may be there but because we're in the we're in the environment which is friendly which can actually destroy viruses and bacteria now let's look at earthly cities when when men were after noah came out of the ark god says to him in uh, genesis chapter 9 verse 1 and god blessed noah and his sons and said unto them be uh, unto them be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth so already god is saying he gave adam and eve the garden of eden and then after the destruction of the flood he actually said to men go and replenish the earth but now the devil has a plan in genesis chapter 11 verse 4 and they said go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth it was never the plan of god and it will never be you know i come from uh, zimbabwe that's my home country i love it i'll go there very soon uh, there is a place called uh, Chibi. I come from about, I'm just about 20 miles from Chibi City. Now, many people around Chibi, they leave their rural homes and they go and they build houses at Chibi. So I was asking a question, why are people doing this? They said, because you know what, when they go close to the city, there is electricity, there is running water. But now you find that, you know what, you can do all those things when you are in your rural area. You don't really need to go into the CBD or you don't need to go into town for those things. You can experience those things when you are in your rural home. But the question is, why do people love the city life? You know, it says in Country Living, page 5, book 2, parents flock with their families to the cities 
because they fancy it easier to obtain a livelihood there than in the country. In the country, you have to work. If you are lazy, you find it very hard. But in the city, sometimes you find it very easy. Why? Because there is benefit system. There are plenty of jobs, so they say the transport access is easy. I don't have to walk five kilometers. I can just walk uh, uh, just 100 meters. I'm at the bus stop or I just walk into my car. You know, when I was growing up, I grew up in Chibi. Sometimes, you know, Chibi in Zimbabwe, they're just up, uh, you know, in Pasli in Popo here in Zimbabwe. You know, things sometimes were very hard in Chibi. It's a dry area. And uh, I remember sometimes we used to walk about nearly five kilometers to go and fetch water. Life was hard. And then we woke up at 3 a.m. to go to the field. That was difficult. But however, uh, that was actually the best life. Of course, we could improve it. Rather than walking five kilometers for water, we could dig a bowl for ourselves. And then that would be much easier. There. And rather than plowing with, the, with, with cows and donkeys, we could actually use a tractor at home. And you can make life easier while you are at home. Now, so we want easy transport. Well, you could use a bicycle while you're in a rural place. And then uh, people want to live close to one another because it is easy to visit. When you're in town, houses are very close. And they also say that the education, uh, there's easy education and plenty of riches. That's the misconception which we have. Or probably that's the artificial part of life that we see in town. And when we look at those things, we say, this is what we want for our children. But, you know, the city life has its challenges. I don't deny that I've, uh, I'm, I've lived uh, in a city. I don't deny that, you know, my life, I grew up in rural areas. I grew up in rural areas, uh, hard life, but, of course, uh, an experienced life. It is the rural area life which has made me to be what I am today. But uh, I came into town seeking greener pastures, thinking that is the best thing. I actually realize, as Ellen White says, that, you know, there is quite a lot of artificial, like, city life is very artificial. It says in the book, Country Living, page 6, paragraph 1, life in the cities is false and artificial. That sounds very strong, but listen, the intense passion for money getting, the will of excitement and pleasure seeking, the thirst for display, the luxury and extravaganza all are forces that with the great mass of mankind are turning the mind from life's true purpose. You know, in, life, in, in the city we want to enjoy. We want to go for entertainment. We want to go for parties. We want to go for amusement. We, wa we want to go for all kinds of things. And then also we live a life of competition. I, I live here in England. I've seen it. If my next door neighbor is driving a Mercedes, I think I should go also for a BMW. If he's driving a BMW 3 Series, maybe probably I should go also for a 5 Series. If my neighbor is driving a Porsche, maybe I should go for also for a Lamborghini. No, I'm just relating what i see happening sometimes you see these things at church where people are competing what's the best or oh, if she's wearing a dress from uh from uh, monsoon i need to buy one from dabenams if she says that she has got one for dabenams i need one for john from john lewis if she's having one from john lewis I will make a trip to Ted Baker and get one. But if she has got one from Ted Baker, then I have to go for Harold's. To Harold. This is all competition. It's so artificial. The question is, where do they get money from? Oh, credit cards. Oh, loans. And what will end up? They will end up in serious financial problem. That's why sometimes in, in the cities, people commit suicide because of debts. They are trying to keep up appearances. They are trying to live like anyone else. Yet there is something better to life. He said they are opening the door to a thousand evils. Envy, jealous, covetousness. Upon the youth, 
they have almost irresistible power. You know, when children are combating on toys, I live in a world where there are so many gadget, toys, gadgets, you know, children compete for toys. There are these parents who think they've got so much money they can afford to buy toys, toys, 500 pounds, 1,000 pounds, 700 pounds. They are buying for their children and when the children go, they play. The competition is irresistible and therefore they are damaged because they cannot cope. It's in the papers. You read the papers. These stories, you find them on YouTube. Young people, they now have mental health. They will be complaining that I can't cope. I can't cope with my friends. They are laughing at me. I, they, it's a life of competition which is artificial. Now it says here, there is not one, now listen to the advice. There is not one family in a hundred who will be improved physically, mentally, or spiritually by residing in the city. In other words, it's, it's a disadvantage to be in the city. Faith, hope, love, happiness can far better be gained in retired places where there are fields and hills and trees. You know, when we are in the countryside, we can go for prayer in the forest. When we are in the countryside, we can refresh going around, walking around. When we are in the countryside, we have the joy of there is no much noise there. You can sit down and meditate. And this is the expectation of God that when we are in the garden, physically we are being improved. Mentally, we have a peace of mind. Spiritually, we are meditating. This is the best place which God has given. Now listen to the directive of God. Country Living, page 13, paragraph 1. Take your children, now to those with children, take your children away from the sights and sounds of city, away from the rattle and din of street cars and teams, and their minds will become more healthy. It will be found easier to bring home to their hearts the truth of the word of God. Our children, they do better in the countryside. I know we want the best for them. If I can live in the city, working for the, from the, for the best company, my child goes to the best school in the city, and they go to the best universities. Oh, that's a good thing. Yeah, that, that, that sounds good. But the question is, spiritually, how much are they benefiting or how much are they losing? You know, the problem with city life, the city life has never been good and the problem of city life will always continue to be worse and worse. We cannot doubt the fact that the city life has made us to benefit something. It is because of city life that we are able to do so many things. We can develop our homes, we can develop our countryside because we are working in the city. But we could actually work in the city while we are living out of the city. Country living Page 9, paragraph 5 says, looking at what will happen in the city. The time is fast coming when the controlling power of the labor unions will be very oppressive. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Remember on Sunday we talked about the mark of the beast. When they will, nobody, when nobody will, will buy nor sell except he has a mark of the beast. Imagine when you are in town and the mark of the beast has been declared and your children are crying for food. You will be forced to receive the mark of the beast to sustain your children. Yet if you are living in the country producing your own things, you are safer. You know, I, I, I talk this from experience. Uh, I lived in the rural area. We produce food from our food from our garden, vegetables. We will milk our cows. We will sell milk every day. We have money to buy tomatoes if we don't have some in the garden. We have money to buy vegetables from our garden. We have a milli meal from our fields. 
and we have whatever was necessary, whatever was a need. The only thing that I know we used to buy religiously, it was sugar and salt. For that reason, we could survive so well. And sometimes we will not buy oil. We have our oil from our milk. We have our oil from our groundnuts. Those things were very easy. And if we can live that kind of life, it's cheaper. And the budget was so limited. With very little, we can afford good life. You know, there is safety in the country living. It says, uh, we should now begin to heed, that's country living, uh, page 9, book five, uh, uh, paragraph 5. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. Get out of the cities into rural district where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. You don't need to live crowded. You know, I was, um, I was privileged. In that uh, my father was a farmer. As he was a farmer, we lived on our small farm. The next house was uh, it's half a kilometer on the other side. And the other one is nearly a kilometer the other side. And the other one is about two and a half kilometers the other side. And the other one is about three kilometers the other side. And we were just left on our own there managing our affairs. You know, I actually didn't realize that that was the best life. Because uh, I used to go to the school where I would meet these people who live very who, who, from the rural areas. It is only now when, I talking to, when I'm talking to those people in rural areas. And there, some of them, they are, they are of my age. They say, you know what? You lived a poshy life on a farm. That was the best life. But I actually didn't understand it that way. Now, the point which I'm trying to drive home is this. God wants us to live without interference, where we can manage our affairs on our own. Why? Because at least we have time of meditation. We can talk to, uh, to God without interruption. We are free from the laws which can restrict our liberty. It says, uh, uh, country living, page 21, paragraph 1. The Protestant world have set up an idol Sabbath in the place where God's Sabbath should be. And they are treading in the footstep of the papacy. So when they have set up this false Sabbath, what will happen? It means that they will declare the National Sunday Law. And when the National Sunday Law has been declared, it says, For this reason, I see the necessity of the people of God moving out of the cities into retired country places where they may cultivate the land and raise their own provision. Thus, they may bring their children up with simple, healthful habits. I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for the crisis. We are preparing for the crisis as we have learned. Now in preparation for the country, for the crisis, right now we are living in the city or some of us are in the city. Some may already be in crisis in, in, you know, in the country homes. As we are living in the city, my brothers and sisters, the question that I ask myself is where is your home? Where is your retired home? There are some of us who have been in town for 20 years and we don't even have a small hut. We don't have even a small hut in the rural area. A small house. We don't even have any place which is called by our name. All what we are doing, we are just working, enjoying our money, living crowded, working, enjoying our money. But we don't seek to understand that we need to prepare. Being a man... Let me talk to men. Being a man is to have a home. Being a man is to have a place which is called by your name. Being a man is to have a place that when you, when you have finished working, you go and retire at your home, your homestead. You know, uh, this, this message was calculated in my mind from a very tender age. I started working at a 23. I decided to build a house at home. I started building, preparing for home. That was very important. And you know, when I'm talking to people in Africa, they know what country living is very well because our parents, almost all our parents, they have a country home. I don't dispute that there are some who do not have a country home, but listen, you cannot walk in that footsteps. The time has come that you need to prepare a country home while things are fine because the time 
When you are not going to get a job, you know Zimbabwe has taught us lessons. And I want to say that, you know what, it may come to South Africa, be careful. In Zimbabwe and in many other countries, in Zimbabwe, the year 2008, it was not enough. The amount you were paid monthly was not enough for the bus fare for a week. And there were no food in the shops. The people who had the best life were those in rural areas who had their gardens, who had their fields, who had produced their food. They had enough. But those in town, things were so hard. But I don't want to go very far. I can tell you of the coronavirus. In England, shops were closed. There was rationing of groceries. It was hard and tough. And it was so difficult to manage. And I wished we could be in a place where we produce our own. And if we could produce our own and we have got our own electricity, we have got our own water, we have got our own soccer ways, we have got our own septic tanks, that would have been the best life. And however, the crisis that was caused by coronavirus, this crisis will continue to get worse and worse. As we well, during this the, the time of coronavirus, we are still in the time of coronavirus, but here in England, things seem to be getting better and better every day. There is a message which I did, which was, uh, say, COVID-19. I think it was preparation for the National Sunday Law. When I was looking, it's on our YouTube uh, Herald Report channel. When I was looking at the crisis, which was happening in the city, and I actually realized that, you know, this is a rehearsal or what will happen when the National Sunday Law has been declared. The crisis in South Africa, it is more or less similar to the current crisis in the United States. Maybe probably it is worse in the United States at the moment. And it will just become worse. And they are saying that, you know what? Because over 20 million have lost their jobs. Not only that, people cannot afford their mortgages. Let people go without paying their mortgages. It has happened here in England that for three months there was holiday mortgage. People were not paying bills because they could not afford. But now people are to pay bills. Where will they get money from? They are given loans. And when they are given loans, now you, when you have got loan after loan after loan, then you are a servant of their government. government. And when you are a servant of the government, you are in serious problem. Yet if you can afford a simple home, where you produce your own food, then you have a comfortable life. So God is saying when we move out of the cities and when we produce our food out of the cities, we live a comfortable life. He says, thus they may bring their children up with simple healthful habits. I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for the crisis. I was um, in February. I went to Zimbabwe for a little while. So I was driving. I met a gentleman in, in fact, I, I gave a lift to a gentleman in Harare. And uh, he was working in the city. So he said, I'm going home. I said, where do you live? He said, I live about 30 kilometers out of, no, 60 kilometers out of the city. I said, so that's where you live? He said, that's where I go every day. I work in the city, but I live in my rural area. I manage my things there. And said, that's a good life. Say, yeah, that's the, I've been doing this for the past. I think he gave, I think for about 10 years or so, he's doing that. He is managing his life very well living in the city. But however, I'm not going to dwell much on that point. I'll come back to it when I'm concluding. And then we can open for questions. But now let's look at this. We have looked at the advantages of living in the city. Jobs. Education. Proximity to one another. These things are very good. But what is the disadvantage? The crimes in the city. The pollution in the city. The noise in the city. The diseases in the city. The water of the city. The contamination. Even though there could be advantages, but the disadvantages, they outweigh the advantages. 
But am I saying that we should leave the cities now? I am saying that, you know what, we need to prepare to leave the city. And if God blesses us, that we can actually work from the work in the city and living outside the city. That's the best thing to do. But the question is, what should we do as the children of God? Let me use a case study of Lot. Because Lot lived in the city. And Jesus decided to mention the name of Lot in Luke chapter 17. The Bible says from Luke chapter 17 from verse 8, 28. Likewise also as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drink, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. You realize that you know what? As the judgments of God are falling, the first places to be destroyed are cities. In fact, before the declaration, before, before the last seven plagues, God would deal with the cities first. So what we see at the moment, these calamities which are happening in the cities and these pestilence which are happening in the cities God is already dealing with the city slowly but however the disasters and calamities in the cities will get worse now the Bible says as it was in the days of Sodom and then it gave us the example of Lot what did Lot do what's so special about this family Lot was a cousin of Abraham Lot left Haran with Abraham. But they came to a point in, in the book of Genesis chapter 30, 13 that Lot and Abraham could not stay together. So they had to separate. The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 13 from verse 12, Abraham dwelt in the land of Canaan and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his sin toward Sodom. Lot was not living in Sodom initially. Lot was given a chance with Abraham. If you choose the left, I go to the right. If you choose the east, I go to the west. What do you prefer? Lot lifted his eyes and he looked at the plain of Jordan towards Sodom. And he liked the green grass. It looked very beautiful. So he left that place where Abraham was and he went towards Sodom. That's what we've done, is it? Some of us, we have left our home. At one point, I said to myself, ah, it's hard here in Zimbabwe. Let me go to London. So I went to London and I lived in London. Well, I don't live in London anymore, but uh, I went for greener pastures. And that's what Lot was doing, going for greener pastures. But now, it says, verse 18, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before God, before the Lord exceedingly. Did Lot knew that the men of Sodom were sinners? Did Lot understand that things are not well in Sodom? Did Lot ever thought of the influence of Sodom in his life? No. He looked at the greener pastures. That's what we do today. When I think of the money that I will get, that, you know, I found a job in Dubai. They will give me 100,000 uh, US dollars per year. I will leave my family. And then I'll, I'll come and visit them once a year, at least for a week. I know that's what many of us are doing. That has never been the plan of God. When we were growing up, our fathers and our forefathers used to go to Wenela. They would go to Wenela, which is Jobek. It's, I think it's Jobek from Zimbabwe. They would go to Wenela for two, three, five years. He's there. He has left the wife. He has left the children. That was a hard life. That was tough, man. And today, some of us, we do it that, you know, we go to work, we look for greener pastures. We would rather go for two, three years. And all what we do right now, these days of WhatsApp, you just be uh, uh, doing WhatsApp, finding out how people are. But of course, the end result is not good. We know it. It's not good. Some will begin to cohabit. Some will have other wives. Some will have the small houses. Hey, do you live with your family? Even though when you have little, you keep them and look after them. So let's actually do some application. So Lot decided to choose Sodom. Why did he choose Sodom? Patrick's and Prophets, page 133, paragraph 1 says, Desert with visions of worldly gain, Lot overlooked the moral and spiritual evil that would be encountered there. The inhabitants of the plain were sinners before the Lord exceedingly, but, Lord, but of this he was ignorant. 
or knowing gave it but little weight, he chose him all the plain of Jordan and pitched his tent towards Sodom. How little did he foresee the terrible results of the selfish choice? Now it says that you know this was actually a selfish choice of Lot. In doing that, he did not consider his family. He made a choice which was so selfish. And as he went to Sodom, he thought he was going to make money. The first thing that we think when we leave our homes going to the cities, we think of money, we think of the benefit, but we don't think of the losses. But now let's count the losses of Lot. He went to Sodom, he made a lot of money, he made a name, he was known in Sodom, but let's count the losses. And then when we count the losses, then we know what to do. It happened that Sodom was to be destroyed. As Sodom was to be destroyed, Abraham interceded for Lot. As he interceded for Lot, the angels, then, then God heard the prayer. So God was going to save Lot. So the angels went and they said to Lot, listen, listen we are going to destroy this city. Do you have any or anyone that you have, any of your children or any of your relatives that you want to come up with? The Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 19 verse 14, and Lot went out and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the, the Lord would destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-laws. So Lot, Lot had two daughters which were married, and with their, with, with their husbands, they refused to come out of Sodom. You know, city life can be good. Driving is easy. Jobs are easy. Benefit system is easy. We live close to one another. I can afford what I want. I can drive what I want. You think I can leave the city? Oh, let me give you a story because I know some of you may understand this. I've got a, a, a friend of mine. He was talking to a colleague. And then it happened that as they were discussing, they said, Oh, my friend. Things have changed now. Let's actually go. Let's go back home. Let's go back home to Zimbabwe. And then the guy looked at him and said, hey, he is here in England. He said, listen, me living Canaan here, going to Zimbabwe, living Canaan, to him, England was a Canaan. And he said, no, I'm not going to go there. If you go, go yourself. In fact, you find that, you know, when it comes to leaving the city, especially in diaspora here, when people say, let's go back home, a lot of divorces take place. The husband will go, the wife will remain behind. Or the wife will go, the husband will remain behind. And sometimes you realize that, you know, it will take 10, 15, 20 years. The wife is still there, the husband is still there. What is happening? Somebody does not want to leave. So, they refused to come. So, now Lot has lost two daughters and he has lost sons-in-laws. Now, listen to uh, Patrick's and Prophets, page 159, paragraph 3. His daughters were influenced by their husbands. They were well enough off where they were. They could see no evidence of danger. Everything was just as it had been. They had great possessions and they could not believe it possible that beautiful Sodom would be destroyed. Do you believe that Deben will be destroyed? Do you believe that Jobek will one, one day sink? Do you believe that England, London will sink? All that we have invested will come to nothing. But they said no. So now Lot lost this for. He says, some of his children clung to Sodom and his wife refused to depart without them. The thought of leaving those whom he had he held dearest on earth seemed more than he could bear. It was hard to forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by the labors of his whole life to go forth a destitute wanderer. All what Lot was working for, he was investing in Sodom. Where are you investing your money? Maybe probably all what you are working for, you are investing in Deben. All what you are working for, you are investing in London. Therefore, you find that, you know, 
the Bible says in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 6, Jesus talking, say, where your, your money is, that's where your heart is. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So the treasure of Lot, the treasure of his children, they were in Sodom and their hearts were in Sodom and to them living Sodom was a loss of everything. So they said, the wife said, uh, listen, I will not leave Sodom. I've heard what you have said, but as for Sodom, ah, no. So now look at the loss. Let's count the loss. Two daughters have been lost. Two son-in-laws, they've been lost. All that Lord had worked for has been lost. Now, the wife, look at what happened to the wife. Loss number three. But his wife, that's Genesis chapter 19, 26. But his wife looked back from behind him. And she become a pillar of salt. So number three, he has, in fact, number four, he has lost the wife as well. Just count the loss. All the children, all the riches. So what is the benefit? In Shona, we say, Meaning that even though we ate yesterday, but we still want to eat today. Even though Lot may have enjoyed yesterday, but he still wants something today. Now he has lost everything. Could he have done a better investment than what he did? You know, it says, Lot made his way to the mountains and abode in a cave. Stripped of all for which he had dared to subject his family to the influence of the wicked city. But the case of Sodom followed him even here. The sinful conduct of his daughters was the result of the evil associations, associations of the vile place. What did they do? It says its moral corruption had become so interwoven with the, their character that they could not distinguish between good and evil. Lot's only posterity, the Moabites and the Ammonites, were vile idolatrous tribes, rebels against God, and bitter enemies of his people. Now, you ask yourself, where did he go wrong? He went wrong in the marriage. You realize that, you know, Lot married a Sodomite. His wife, Lo, uh, Mrs. Lord, she was a sodomite. Number two, he went wrong in that he allowed his children to be married to the sodomites. Number three, he went wrong in that he decided to live among the sodomites. When in actual fact, he had an opportunity to live out of Sodom and still acquire the same riches. The man had lost. He lost everything. All what he was trying to gain, he lost. Now these two daughters that he thought he had remained, they were just sodomized to heart and they were lost. And their tribes is Moabites and Ammonites. Now listen to uh, Country Living, page 30, paragraph 5. Yet Lot could have preserved his family from many evils had he not made his home in this wicked, polluted city. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them, even if they had lived in a place some distance away from the city. I ask a question. Who was richer, Abraham or Lot? Who had more money, Abraham or Lot? You realize that, you know what, Abraham was even more than 100 times richer than Lot. Yet he was living outside the city. You know, there was farm invasion in Zimbabwe in the, around 2000, year 2000, 2000 and from to 1999, uh, is it 2000 and 2000 going uh, 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 somewhere then. The people though were living in the farms, mostly they were whites. And of course, the blacks also had farms. But now, I come to this realization Farmers were much richer than people who were living in town. They will produce and they sell. And at that point, Zimbabwe was known as the breadbasket of Africa. And Zimbabwe was sustained by farmers. 
especially in region 1, region 2, region 5, region 6, they were supplying everything of Zimbabwe, what Zimbabwe needed. They were very rich, and they are still rich. And you can also be as rich as that if you want to. If you just need to know that by being a farmer, working in your garden, God blessing what you do because God has promised that he will bless, he will bless you tremendously. Growing things. But now, let me actually uh, focus uh, on, uh, let me actually, uh, let, let's go further. Uh, looking at the mistake of Lot. Patrick's and Prophets, page 168, paragraph 4. Many are still making a similar mistake in selecting a home. They look more to the temporal advantages they may gain than to the moral and social influence that will surround themselves and their families. They choose a beautiful and fertile country or remove to some flourishing city in the hope of securing greater prosperity, uh, posterity, prosperity, but their children are surrounded by temptations and too often they form associations that are unfavorable to the development of piety and formation of the right character. You know, things are so hard sometimes. I'll, I'll talk of uh, Zimbabwe, where I come from. Things are so hard. We had to leave home for greener pastures. Oh, yes. And people are still living home. And I want to believe some of us may be in diaspora because of that. But now, the question is, if you put everything on a scale, in being in diaspora, you are benefiting. That's okay. But where you are living, what's the advantage of where you are vis-a-vis -vis the disadvantage of where you could be? When you have chosen a home where you are choosing, is that home molding you or destroying you? Yeah, you are making money, that's okay. But while you are making 20,000, let me just say, while you are making, uh, let me guess, while you are making 100,000 runs per year, how much are you losing? Are you not making 100,000 runs and you are losing 200,000 runs? Oh, maybe probably that figure is too big. Let me say, say, are you not making 50,000 runs per year? And you are losing 75,000 runs per year. Is it really balancing? When you look at your life, are you building your life? Or you are destroying your life? Is what you are doing benefiting you? Or costing you eternally. These are the things that we need to think for seriously. And it calls for decision making. Let me actually begin to conclude this so that we can discuss. It says in the book of Patrick's and Prophets, page 169, paragraph 2. Those who secure for their children worldly wealth and honor at the expense of their eternal interest. Will find in the end that these advantages are a terrible loss. Like Lot. Many see their children ruined and barely save their own souls. Their life work is lost. Their life is a sad failure. Had they exercised true wisdom, their children might have less of worldly prosperity, but they would have made sure of a title of immortal inheritance. And I've given you the example of Abraham. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 8, the Bible says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should uh, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing where, whether he went. By faith he so joined in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, hearers with him of the same promise. Abraham had power to build a city. Abraham had money to build a city. But Abraham decided that he was not going to stay in a city. He decided to live in the country. And by living in the country, Abraham preserved himself, pro preserved his family, and the covenant remained with Abraham. What am I saying? God has given us a chance to choose where we want to live. We are in a situation where we are today, but we need to be preparing. One, 
let's prepare for the national sunday law in preparation for the national sunday law we need to have a home somewhere in the country and when we have a home in the country let's develop that home and let it be our desire to go and live there and if possible as god is leading us rather than to live crowded in this uh, in, in, in crowded Let's try and live somewhere where it's not crowded, where we have peace of mind, where we can produce our food. We can all do that. All these things are possible if we pray and ask God to do that. Even in diaspora, we can live in a countryside. You know, I always think of my brother. He lives in uh, South Africa there. He produces a lot of vegetables and uh, he has got goats. Uh, he, he does. He has got a small place where he does farm farming. I, I've not been there, but you know he manages life even in South Africa. You could manage life even in the United States of America, even in England. You can still manage life from the countryside. You don't have to live in the city, even though you are still in the city at the moment. But by God's grace, he could help you that you may come out of that environment and you can live a life out of the city. Now, this was the presentation for this afternoon. I'll ask now if there is anybody with a question. Then we'll deal with the question. So if there is anybody with a question, let's deal with that. I'm just going to change my... Uh, I'm just going to change so that you can hear me. Right, so that's fine. So I was just trying to make the sound system possible so that you can hear me. So now I want to ask whether if there's somebody who has something to say, any questions or any additions as we progress. Anybody who has got a question, anybody who has something to say regarding this topic. Yeah. The country and the rural area is one and the same thing. That's the country. When you are in the rural area, you are in the country. That's why you are in the countryside. That's why I was saying some of us, we grew up in the countryside. We're in the rural area. That's the countryside. Yes, is there any other question? Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, my question is, uh, what about some of those rural areas which are also densely populated? You will see that some walls are not far distant from each other. Uh, uh, is it proper country living, or maybe there is a the recommended kilometers that at least a home is should be far away from each other by certain recommended kilometers? You know, when you look at uh, the message of country living, especially if you study from the book Maranatha, the declaration of, of the National Sunday Law, it's actually a signal to move out of the city into small towns in preparation to go to the remote areas. In other words, you are, it's a progressive. So if you are in the rural area, you are in a much better position. Then you can improve that as the spirit of the Lord leads. You know what God wants is that when you are in your house, you need to manage your affairs in your house and nobody should know what is happening in your house. You don't want any interference. That's what it is. It's not that you are supposed to live 10 kilometers from another house or one kilometer, but you need to be in a place where there are no interference, where you can produce your own food. In fact, the spiritual prophet said, you need to have a small piece of land where you produce your things. And if it's a small piece of land, you may not be very far distant from other homes, but at least in your small piece of land, you are productive and you can feed yourself. Not only can you feed yourself, you could even feed others. Yes. Any other questions?
<laughs> okay, that's fine. No problem at all. Uh, I think it's actually very important. I was just trying to see that, you know, I could get a quotation about that, which I could actually help uh, to look, uh, to answer that question uh, uh, accurately. Uh, I cannot see the quotation which I wanted to, but, uh, you know, as I've said that, you know what, Ellen White says, the declaration of National Sunday Law is time to leave the big cities to small to rural districts in preparation to go to the remote areas. Therefore, right now, it's time to prepare to leave the cities. Because you find that, you know what, the reason why we started uh, dealing with the reason, we, we, we mentioned clearly that, you know what, city life is not ideal. Where possible, let's actually live out of the city. Now, let me use this quotation. It may help me. Uh, from Life Sketches, page 405 and five, uh, four, uh, 410. It says, out of the cities, out of the cities, this is the message the Lord has given me. The earthquake will come. The floods will come. And we are not to establish ourselves in the wicked cities where the enemy is served in every way and where god is so often forgotten what actually that means is we are in the city yes but is it the ideal no it's not the ideal the ideal is to be in the countryside then the question is when are we to leave the city the time to leave the city it was never ideal for us to be in the city but however we have found ourselves in the city because of the situation economically this is where we could be financially this is where we could be therefore what then should we do and even sometimes spiritually god may want you to be in the city spiritually for that reason in that situation you realize that you know what maranatha say the book maranatha says i think it's page two something i can't remember if i would have prepared i would have read it says that you know what the declaration of the national sunday law is time to leave the cities but now the question is when should i prepare to leave the cities i should be preparing now in fact there is a there is a there is a quotation which i can actually read regarding uh, this lovely friend who may have sold his house and the question is uh, how was that the best thing to do you know i'll safely say that you know that could be uh, the most ideal things to do because if you have got something that you are tied on, when they declare the National Sunday Law, then you are in serious problems that you will not be able to sell it. Because if you sell it, you need to have received the, the mark of the beast. Therefore, now you will not be able to leave the city. Let me actually answer this. Give me five minutes. Let me answer this with two quotations. Uh, the first one is broadside, uh, January 2. 1849 uh, talking about the person who have sold his house i saw it was the will of god that the saints should cut loose from every encumbrance dispose of their houses and the lands before the time of trouble comes and make a covenant with god by sacrifice ellen white is saying before the national sunday law if we can dispose our properties then we don't have anything that we are tied on. So if, for example, I'm in the city, I've got this heavy mortgage. When the National Sunday Law comes, I may have a serious problem of disposing that. But however, if I can make a covenant with God, and if I have an agreement with God, then God can help me to know when to sell. So if God may have sold to your say to your brother, we have sold your, his house, this is now time to sell your house. 
that's you know that's God and him talking and that's the best thing to do and God saw it with that way I agree with the brother that may have sold his house that's the best thing if God has spoken to him and he said this is time to do that please do it it says I now listen to last day events I've got another quotation which I'll read after this one it says uh, I saw that if any held on their property and did not inquire of the Lord as to their duty, he would not make known duty. He would not make duty known. And they would be permitted to keep their property. And in the time of trouble, it will come up before them like a mountain to crush them and they would try to dispose of it but would not be able but if they desire to be taught he would teach them in a time of need when to sell and how much to sell my brothers and sisters i want to believe that many of us in the city may have properties Many of us may have done investments, but if we are consistent with God and we put everything before God, God will tell us when to sell our properties, number one. God will tell us how much to sell them, number two. And God will tell us where to invest the money that we have sold our properties. But as long as we are consistent with the way how we live, we have nothing to fear. The most important thing is that, you know what, we need to be consistent we need to be consistent with god and we need to be listening to his voice regularly consistently so if we have not yet started praying let's begin to pray my brothers and sisters of when we can get rid of our properties as i've said to you i'm a zimbabwean <laughs> some of you, you can know by my name i'm a proper zimbabwean i've spoken to quite a lot of people in zimbabwe including pastors and they will tell you that, you know what, now, country living, people are now in town, so we should be where people are. But I've read you a quotation which says that, you know what, Enoch, in fact, I may not have read you that quotation, but let me read it now. Country living, page 30, paragraph 4. It says, as God's commandment keep, uh, keeping people, we must leave the cities as did Enoch, we must work in the cities but not dwell in them. We should come and preach in the cities but we should not dwell with them. in them. We can go and earn a living in the cities but you know what? We can go and make money in the cities as we are doing now. But if God help us, let us not dwell in them. That's what it says. And then it says here, Enoch walked with God. And yet he did not live in the midst of any city polluted with every kind of violence and wickedness as did Lot in Sodom. So the comparison here is between Lot and Enoch. Lot lived in the city and he even failed evangelism. Enoch lived in the countryside. And he was successful and his character building, he was successfully successful to the extent that God did not allow him to die. God translated him alive. What am I saying? I am saying the ideal thing is to follow the plan of God. That's why you find that, you know, all those people who understand, especially I've actually come to this realization. I will tell you of England. In England, the rich people of England most of them they don't live in london they have a small flat in london they go and they make money in london and then they go to their places i can tell you of the prime ministers of london you realize that you know the prime minister of london boris johnson he has got a home not very far from here in oxford the former prime minister david cameron has got a home not far from here in Oxford. They are all in the country. The former Prime Minister of, uh, of England, uh, Theresa May, she has got a home in Maidenhead, not in the city. They may have small flats in the city, but they have got a home in the countryside. What exactly does that mean? They know the value of the country. They know what it means to live in. The, they, they know the, the, the advantages of being in the countryside. What I'm saying is this, you know what, some of us because of our situation, we have found ourselves in the city, but we should be preparing to leave the cities. And where possible, please, let's not live in the cities. It's the advantage. Like now, 
We can talk of evangelism that if we leave the cities, who is going to evangelize? That's what many people do say when they're arguing. But now look at this. Today I'm preaching, I'm in England here. I'm preaching from my house in England. I'm preaching to you down there in Africa. I'm preaching to you in America there. I'm preaching to you in uh, wherever you are. How is the gospel moving? God did an extraordinary thing. While we can look co at coronavirus as a disadvantage, I want you to understand that, you know what, in the plan of God, coronavirus has moved the gospel. Coronavirus has worked in a way that the devil never thought of. He never thought that the gospel would move that way. What am I saying? The plan of God is that, you know what, if God says move out, I'm looking forward to the time when I'll be able to leave uh, England and be in the rural place. I look forward and I hope that will be very early. And I've actually set a timetable that very soon I'll retire from the job I'm doing and I'll do a different job altogether, producing. God wants us to have businesses. God wants us to, have to, to be able to lead our own lives. God wants us to manage our own things. That you know what, when I want to go in to do evangelism, I close my office, I go and evangelize. When the Sabbath has come, and before the Sabbath, even a 12 midday, I close my industry, I prepare for the Sabbath. That's the desire of God, leading a country life. You know the food that we eat at the moment? Chemicalized. Almost everything is full of chemical. It's the food that is causing all these diseases. But if I'm producing my own maize, if I'm producing my own vegetables, if I'm producing my own beans, if I'm producing my own peanut butter, I have the best food, which is healthy. If I have an orchard for my fruits, I have the best food. That's the desire of God. Yes, any question? Any more questions? Thank you very much. Let me answer this question with about three or four slides. The first one, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, the Bible says, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door will be opened. What exactly am I saying? I am saying, if you do not have skills, you ask God. God can help you to have a skill. You know, I've got a small allotment here. I, I produce vegetables. The first time I started the allotment here in England, I did some vegetables. I realized that, you know what, they did not do very well. So I've stopped doing those ones. I focus on some vegetables. I've actually come to the realization that there are some vegetables which do very well. I've been learning. And now I know that if I do spinach, spinach does very well. If I do onions, onions, they do very well. If I do pumpkins, the pumpkins, they do very well. If I do, if I do, there are quite a lot of other things which do very well. And I have, uh, I've mastered, to, I, now I have an understanding. You know what, and I've actually realized that, you know what, now when I go to the garden, I used to work by myself. But now I go with my wife and children. You know, I was sick last year, now I don't have as much strength. And now, my wife could not dig as much as she's doing now. My kids were not as good as they are now. Now they have improved. And I, I know for sure, when they go into the garden, they do wonders. The gar gardening is just a skill. You just go in there today. You manage and see how they go. Next year you improve and improve and improve. Now you find that you know what? 
We should learn from the words of Jesus. Let me read another verse, Matthew chapter 25, from verse uh, 14. Because the, the economy of heaven is all agriculture. It says, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own son servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several of, uh, of uh, several ability, and straight away he took his journey. So now these are three. These are three people who have been given three different talents. Let's say we are in the countryside. We are three. We are different people. Now we know that there is somebody who specializes in this kind of farming. We know that there is somebody who specializes in this kind of farming. Whenever I do this presentation, I always give an example of my father. My father was a farmer. Initially, he was a teacher, and then he retired from teaching very early. He went into farming, and he knew farming very well. He actually trained others to farm. So he bought a farm with his friends. Uh, with, they went to farms with his friends. Him, my father... He went with his, uh, his in-law, Mr. Mande, and then he went, Mr. Mande, with his relative, Mr. Marira, and with my father's brother, Mr. Magomo, and then uh, and also with another neighbor, Mr. Gwandira. Now, these guys were very different. They were totally different. Now, Mr. Ma Mr. Chigogora was good in growing things. He understood the, the signs of soil. So he would train them. But Mr. Rera Magomo, he had a tractor. So when Mr. 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 When Mr. Chigogora wanted to work on his field, he would take the tractor of Mr. Magomo, they would work on, on his farm, on, on, in his field. And then Mr. Mande had a maize meal, he's a, he had a, maize, a, miller, a maize meal, a, a grinding meal. When Mr. Chigogora wants to, to, to grind his maize meal, he will go to Mr. Mande, Mr. Mande will work that for him. And then Mr. Gwandira had a lorry. When Mr. Chigogora wants to carry his produce, he will go to Mr. Gwandira, Mr. Gwandira will produce a lorry. What was happening here? There was sharing of abilities. In other words, uh, they were sharing their skills. So Mr. Magomo, Mr. Marera, Mr. Mande, Mr. Gwandira who come to Mr. Chigogora and they will be taught farming. This is not a hearsay. It's not, it's not a secret. That's exactly what it was. And then they will go and produce for themselves. They had on the, their own farms by themselves. What exactly was happening here? They were teaching one another and they were sharing skills. And in sharing skills, they developed and their children were developing. Now, you know what? Now I, can, I was watching what my father was doing. I can manage things. I can manage farming very well. I can manage farm. Now myself, I cannot manage a small farm like my father. I can even have a commercial farm. You give me 250 hectares. I can manage it very well. I can do cows. I can do goats. I can do sheep. I can produce things. Why? Because I've learned the skill. It's all just about learning just by observing. You can do things. Now, it's, let me read the last, last quotation here or answering this question. Adventist home, page, four, six, uh, one, page 146, paragraph 1. If possible, the home should be out of the city where the children can have ground to Can you can you hear me now? Oh yes, we can hear you. 
Yeah, I think it has happened again. I don't know whether it's a battery or something. It has happened again as it happened that way. So let me actually see. I think how many minutes? I was I was changing the battery so they are fine now hopefully. All right, thank you. Yeah. So now sorry, so I was just That's okay. So what I was saying is this um uh y when you go out in the country you can learn how to do things. And uh, as you learn you learn, you master the skills year after year until you become perfect. You don't necessarily have to be knowing everything the first year, but you just continue it and you'll find that, you know, because this is about growing, God will, helping you, God will be helping you to master things as well. Yes, go ahead, please. Any other questions or any additions? Yes, you are. Yes. Okay, yeah. Brother Chikokora, I thank you for your contribution. Uh, I wanted to find out uh, the issue that you really uh, uh, bothers me in terms of rural country life living, let's say for past Zimbabwe, is the thing of security in the, you know, in the, in the rural areas. Uh, is it a really, uh, uh, I mean, have you ever thought about it security-wise? Is it a good idea? Because... I have thought about it, and most of the time, I always conclude that our secures, your security is really not that good, not as good as it used to be. Maybe 10 years ago, you know, our rural areas were safe and secure, but now, you know, with the things that we see and read about and what other people have experienced, I don't know what you think about the security situation. If you are to move from, you know, from England, you move to your rural home, are you not going to be like a target of, of crime and, you know, things like that? You know, as I was growing up, we had thieves several times. At one point, thieves will come to steal sheep. Thieves will come, thieves will come to steal cows. Even year last year, my mother lost one of her cow. It was stolen. This is happening. This happens every year or every time. I don't think uh, that should be a problem. Here in town, we have lost so many things. Thieves has broken in my house before in town and they've stolen things. And things, thieves break and they steal cows, cars. And there's still quite a lot of things. So I want to believe that, you know what, it, it, God looks after his people. So in terms of the issue of security, I wouldn't think it's a very big thing. Because you know what, you can actually do something to ensure that you have the best security. I'm thinking of going to live in the rural area now. And I'm thinking, what should I do about the issue of security? I can only do what I can. And I'll leave the rest in the hands of God. If God says go and live in the rural area. And then you know what? God can also look after my things. Why don't I employ God to look after my things? You say God you look after my things. I'll look after yours. God I'm going to preach the gospel. As I preach the gospel you look after my field. And you look after my cows. God can actually do that. I don't think security will be any. In fact we are at risk in town much more than in rural areas. I don't deny the fact that the rural area which we knew when we were growing up is different from the rural area that we have now. Why? Because many people are not working. Many people have become, many people are struggling. But still, God will sustain his people. Yes. That's my take on this one. Any, anybody who has something to say? Do you want to make a follow-up? Oh, I, I think that is enough because I 
was just talking based on what I, you know, just this is just a realization um, that you know sometimes we may have these glorious views of our of the rural setting, but the reality is far, I mean, divorced from that. But what he has said is very true because. You know, looking at where we come from in Zimbabwe, in the Midlands area, you know, <laughs> Shuruku areas and all those things that you read about in the news, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is a victim of crime, but potentially, you know, you can be, and as you have said as well, even in cities, people have, have been robbed, you know, armed robbers, violent gun crime is coming to our country as well. So it's just a thing that I was observing because... Mr. Chikokora, you can actually tell people, you know, where you live, where you are, and just some few counties from you, by the way. You know, we leave cars outside, we leave doors unlocked here, and you can just drive. It's not an issue. We don't have buckler bars on our houses. You know, I've never been robbed or been afraid of being robbed. But as you said, we have to leave things in God's hands. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And also, I just need to emphasize that, you know, when we are moving into the country, don't rush. Put your plans before God and ask God to guide you. And as God guides you, you have no regret. You move and you not come back. You don't want to move and then you come back. You move and then you come back. You want to go and you go for real. So it's actually very important. And also I'm thinking about that seriously in terms of... Uh, and when you are moving as well, you just need to go and try and understand where you are going. You need to understand where you are going. What kind of environment, what kind of people are there? Will I be able to cope? Sometimes you may actually need to move where you know some people who may assist you to do things. I, I consider that very important myself. Yes. Anybody who has something to say? You know what? I, I, I think uh, if there is a greener pastor and a young couple is developing, it's a blessing if they can find the best for their life. But however, the young couple should understand that they should lay every plans before God. Where does God want them to be? Remember, we have used the case study of Lot. What was the advantage of Sodom? Because Sodom was a greener pasture for Lot, but it turned to be a disadvantage. So it's actually good for the young couple to move. You know, when I was uh, leaving Zimbabwe, I left Zimbabwe anyway, and then I went, I got married. And my brother said to me, you know what, you have done a good thing that, you know, you are going with your wife on your own, nobody is going to bother you and then you can develop that actually was the best it actually turned out to be the best and it's still the best anyway that i actually decide to live by myself and that is actually helped the greener pastures to be honest it has helped me so much and is helping many others as well so i would advise that if the young couple have found a place for themselves and they are developing themselves they should just lay their plans before God. And if God has given okay, let them go. And explore life. And save God. And also save the community wherever they go. But remembering the ideal for God. Yes. Anyone else? Yeah, no, th thanks, thanks for the opportunity, Brother uh, Nyamuno. Uh, uh, thank you for the presentation, Raj uh, I'm following and I have full interest in this subject. But I, I'm, 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 I'm realizing that we have a future. I want to read this quotation, then I'll comment. I'll give my comment. I have a few uh, items that I disagree with the notion that we need to wait and delay and calculate the moves. Because my understanding is if God says leave the, the city, if he is the one who is, who is positive, if you read this book, uh, testimony, it says the court the, the call that God is giving people that you must leave the city. So if God says leave, you don't have to, to, to be you know to use your your, your, your logic and, and common sense. I think it's a really big challenge in this in this subject. I've seen great preachers getting challenged because we have because of our location. The reason why we do not be honest and truthful about this, this, this message is, is because we are compromised ourselves. Our location is, 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 actually, is actually against what, what, what the inspiration is. is, 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 is the Let me read this 
decision, then I'll, I'll comment. Uh, it's a three day call to leave the cities. Then it, uh, she writes, few realize the importance of shunning so far as possible all associations and friendly to religion, religious life. In choosing their surroundings, few make their spiritual prosperity first consideration. You see, when I write right here, she's actually saying, when we choose the, the location, I, I want actually to answer again, the, 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 I want, also want to contribute on the previous question where the young couple was saying they are recently married and what's the advice. I want to disagree with you. I tend to, I tend to, I tend to differ with you like the <laughs> motion of saying they must go and make money and preach there. The, the instruction is clear. They are saying we mustn't make our decisions based on on the financial gain. We need to consider serious. I think I did not say that. That's what Ellen White is saying here. So it is all about spiritual. Remember, we are spiritual beings. Then I want to read the the the, 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 the party that follows it. Great parents flock with their families to the cities because they fancy it easy to obtain, to obtain a livelihood there than in the country. The children have nothing to do when not in school. Obtain a street education from evil associates. They acquire habits of ice and dissipation. The parents see all this, but it will require a sacrifice. This is what I like most. I actually highlighted like this. But it will require a sacrifice to correct their error. And they stay there where they are and do certain gain full control of their children. You see, if you read the second paragraph, it actually clearly says it, going to the country is not all about the, the Sunday law, the direction, and everything else. Mm -hmm. That is secondary. The major reason why we should go out of the city is to protect our, our, our kids mm -hmm. from the pollution that they might, you know, they will be contaminated by the city life. We, if you look at our, our shaking in, in the city, most of the parents here, both the mother and the father, wake. They go to work and they come very late from work. And the kids, when they come from school, who teaches them the streets? Mm -hmm. So we, we are losing mm -hmm. our kids in the battle to become financial, I mean, I mean financially stable. Then I want to read the last paragraph, then I, 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 I will summarize. Better sacrifice in any and every world consideration than to be that, a special source mm -hmm. of to your kids. See, she says you must sacrifice everything than to put your kids, the source that you are given, at least. So we are risking. The lives of our kids, we are adults, we know the, 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 the bad things about staying in the urban in area. But we're exposing our kids, they're so vulnerable. Uh, and you know, I, I've actually not, not noticed that the time that we have as Adventists here in, in, in our modern church, majority of people came from the back way to the UK, they ultimately to the world, South African, uh, American. Now they are stuck, they can't, they can't now convince their wives that we need to go to the country. So every so those such men who are compromised like that, they cannot push this message. So basically what I'm saying is we, we, we have a serious challenge as a church. And yeah. we are we are challenging individuals. And, mm -hmm. and I've seen that the majority of presenters, especially those that that, 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 that rely on the inspiration, mm -hmm. they don't want to go straight to the point on this yeah. on this subject. Mm -hmm. We we all try to justify our position because we are all in the in the I would say America. <laughs> and tell each other the truth. Yeah. We are following one thing and, 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 and we need to correct this. Mm -hmm. Not only for the of the Sunday law, but for the sake of our kids. Because I've seen kids in my church we have left the, the, the faith because of influence of the community. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I, I, I apologize if I was not straight. I, I think I've read uh, most of the quotations that you have read. Uh, Mr. Chinoda Kufa, and I made it very clear that it is not the I, it was the plan of God for men to be in the countryside, and I made it very clear that there are quite a lot of disadvantage of being in town, and the life in town it's artificial. Uh, we go there for money, we go there for employment, we go there for security benefits. But if I was not very straight, honestly. This is the truth. What you are saying is the truth and we cannot run away from it. Now, when I was talking about this new couple, we have decided to go for greener pastures. I said, uh, in fact, let me read this quotation, Country Living, page 28, paragraph 1. Spread every plan before God with fasting 
and with the humbling of the soul before the Lord Jesus, and commit thy ways unto the Lord, the sure promise is, he will direct thy path. He is infinite in resources. The Holy One of Israel who calls the most, the worst, who, who calls the host of heaven by name and holds the stars of heaven in position has, your indivi has you individually in his keeping. You are very right, my brother, that you know what? If you are living contrary to the message, then you are bound to be compromised because you don't seem to want to speak against what you are doing. Of course, they are, but we have made it very plain and clear that the ideal is to be in the country. That's the ideal for God. But what happened when I'm found in a place where I'm not supposed to be? Then I should be making a move to go out. But the question is, can I just say now, because God says I should be in a country, I should go straight away. No, it does not say that. It says that, you know what, we need to move. In fact, I, I've got a quotation. I've not found it. But if I, if, if, before I finish, if I see it, I'm going to read it. We need to move with wisdom. You don't just need to move anywhere. Otherwise, you end up cursing God. Neither should you rush. In going in the country, you, have, you are very right. You have read that quotation. We go there for spirituality. Because not even one family, not even one in a thousand, as we learn, will be improved spiritually, physically, and mentally by being in the city. So there are quite a number of reasons. Because God says you should be in the country. So therefore, let's do that. Even though if means are difficult, let's find a way where there is a will, God can always make a way. Indeed, I agree with you, my brother. It's actually very important. Country living, that's what God expects us to. I've actually done three presentations on YouTube. I think you can get them uh, on, uh, on country living, part one, part two, and part three. On part three, I was actually focusing on questions, when to move and how we are to move. And regarding the couple I spoke about, I have spoken about, if I was not clear, I was saying that, you know, if the couple wants to go and work somewhere, let them go and do that. But it's actually very important for the couple to spread their plans before God. If God has sent them to a certain place, Remember, not everyone is going to go and live in the countryside. Sometimes some people will preach the gospel until the last minute God will keep them there. I don't know what God has prepared for this young couple. But if God has given a mission for this young couple, let them consider what God has said. If God says to them, go and live in this certain place for a particular reason, so be it. But obeying the truth is the most ideal thing that we can ever do. I hope I have corrected myself if ever I have missed. But I want to believe that most of these uh, points, if you go right from the beginning, you may discover before we started talking about Lot, we actually mentioned about the ideal plan of God. Yes, thank you. Is, but also the message that we are also considering with my wife as a, one of a resolution that we need to make, considering that we really need to prioritize the eternal interest first. Uh, I just need to encourage also uh, all of us brethren that we need to consider this message seriously. We have a lesson that we also pick from the destruction of Jerusalem when the Jews were given a warning. The ones who were only safe were the ones who took the warning seriously for even those who did not uh the second time when the romans came and uh, surrounded the city it was impossible for them to run away i think there's a quotation that i also once i forgot the page in the book which also talk about uh, people who think of even leaving the cities but at times it will be impossible for them to do so and i think mm -hmm. with coronavirus yeah so far so we are able to really see that uh, maybe only those uh, who have got money or who have not lost jobs are able to live well. But those who have lost jobs, who have nothing to sustain their lives in town, they are actually uh, envy those who are in rural areas. Me, yeah. I'm one of them who always say, no, you know, this time uh, I'm really, you know, admiring my father because my father was a soldier and he did not even build a home in town. He built a, 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 
uh, a very good house in rural area. And now it's like my father, he did a very good thing. So I'm just encouraging one of us to say, guys, I think this is the right message and it came at the right time. And with this coronavirus, we can see that anything is possible to be done. In fact, we can even fail to go to the rural areas even when we want to, like probably when the time comes and we feel like we need to run to. So when it comes now, we must take this message more seriously. For us, we also pick from the lesson on the Jews of the world. We realize that they failed even to, to, to escape the, what, the second siege. So it's quite and very important. However, we also took into the consideration of uh, us not taking it as a, uh, a hard decision. We're like, we need to carefully plan and see what are we going to do and all that. Also praying that the good Lord may also assist us. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's a very important point. When you go out into the countryside, you need to have a trade. You need to have a skill. You not just go there to sit down. You need to be producing. You also, you may also need to feed others as well. You know, you 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 cited a very important example of coronavirus. I've got two relatives here who lives here in England, and as they started locking, they flocked out and they went to Zimbabwe. They went very quickly and said, "No, we can't. We can't afford to be here in this." And they went away and said, "No, this is not the right place." They know for sure. That this is not because when you are locked on something, you will not be able to come out. I agree with you, my brother, that you know what? Those that had built their homes, in fact, they didn't. Our foreparents did not even consider a thing to build a house in town, but they developed their homes nicely, and you cannot take them out of their homes. And by God's grace, this is actually my desire. <laughs> I actually also want to go somewhere. In the country. I want to go somewhere in the country. I, I, I am somewhere, but I want to go much further than where I am. And I'm praying that, you know what, God will open the door for me. I've set a time that, you know, at this particular time, I want to be out of this place. And I'm praying that, you know what, if God delay his coming before he allow another lockdown to take place, I should not be locked in again. I should be out. Yes, any other question? Thank you. Before I give the next person, I I think one of the things that we also deal with when we are studying the the, the subject of uh, uh, country living is that also I think mentally Satan also threatens us and he brings the worst of images in our minds. You know, when you always think of rural homes, you think of those homes that are almost slanting that even <laughs> a cow can just come and just, you know, look at anything. <laughs> You know, it, it, it goes down. Yeah. So I just wanted to, to, to present some pictures here. This is, you know, <laughs> I know probably it's only me, but, I, but something like this is exactly what comes to, to my mind whenever you think of country living, you know, to say, mm -hmm. really, do I want to see something like this? And, you know, but as a matter of fact, there are very beautiful farms, there are very beautiful farmhouses. You know, you can have a very decent and very spacious place. One, one of the things that I've seen when you really visit very developed countries is that the space is so squeezed. You know, I, I, I did visit some countries some time back. You know, you are right in town and you are already told that you have already arrived at the place where you are, you are visiting, right in the street. And you can, you, 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 one of my friends was teasing that you are almost like going out with one side and coming back with the right one so that you can change sides when you are sleeping. The space is so small and so squashed that even when your children, say you have three children, you want them to have, uh, I mean, to have autonomy if as different genders or sexes in different rooms, you know, the very packed spaces, it's difficult. I'm talking of especially in South Africa. People are really sleeping with their children in very squalid condition. They want to come cook with here or <laughs> yeah. in formal, in formal shelter. When someone leaves Zimbabwe and him and the children, three children are squashing in two rooms and or in three rooms. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's very bad. You know how, how people can be free as a couple, married couple you know, with their children in, in one room. You know, it's very bad. We have stayed in job back at one point when I just started coming in. There were six of us in one room and it was a horrible experience that, you know, you can concur definitely that in the rural areas, I mean, in, if you get your own space, land is so spacious, it's so spacious, you can 
build as many rooms as possible. You are not limited to anything. If you want to pray out in the nature, it's not as hectic as in the towns. In the towns, you have to move a considerable distance to pray in nature. So mm -hmm. I think definitely the, the plan of God is, is the plan, is the best plan for us. And I think there's a quote where Mrs. White says in, in I think it's Christ's object lesson, which says, a chain is no stronger than the weakest link. The truths of God are like interlinked as a chain. Find that you break one, the whole chain is as useless as that. Mm -hmm. So that means there are certain messages like health reform. Truthfully speaking, I want to say that people that live in town and are vegetarians or are vegans, but they are actually in a worse position than a person who lives in the rural areas who eats his own meat because they are actually eating vegetables that are that are genetically modified, that are pumped things, tomatoes that in a week they are so big. So I think for us to, to completely follow what the Lord wants, we have to be out into the towns, because out of the towns into the countryside because I think complete sanctification when you are when you are staying in town, yes it was possible with Enoch, but I think for many it would be an impossibility with the influences that are there are coming from from the from the urban uh, side. Let me give this time to uh, Brother Omela. He has been raising his hand for a while. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Brother Chukumura, for the beautiful lesson. Hey, we have learned a lot. Um, me and uh, my other church members, we were taking this uh, program so so serious of country living. We've already started an initiative to help each other, to, to fund each other so that we can help each other, other to, to do country living. Uh, but uh, the, the question that I have is uh, the balance like between uh, the educating uh, maybe our children. Uh, does it mean that maybe uh, me and my wife will move into the country, probably uh, when there are no schools? Does it mean that uh, our children must only receive the... the they, home, they must only do homeschooling, no uh, going to, to school or to universities. Hey, hey, can I get a help on that or any quotation that uh, clarifies on that one? Yeah. Uh, I've read about this, my brother. Let me start by saying the initial plan of God was not homeschooling. The first thing, in fact, let me actually start from the first thing. The first place where children get education is home. Homeschooling. In fact, yeah, homeschooling. And then Ellen White gives this advice that when children come together, when, when families come together, they can actually build a small school for their children. And the, the, the church school, the church school, and the children go there. That would be the ideal for the children. However, if you move to a place where there are no schools, then homeschool could be the most... The, in fact, the spiritual prophets say homeschool is the best for our children. Especially with the current influences in the first world, we are better off to homeschool our children. Now, we have got Adventist schools. We have got Adventist primaries. We have got Adventist secondaries. We also have Adventist universities. These could also be the most ideal way we can send our children. However, it's actually very important to realize that, you know, when the groundwork has been done in the home and our children have been taught the difference between left and right, our children can just go to those schools and then they will be like the children of wow dancers. They went into those schools and they could not be polluted by those schools. They went into the universities. Rather than just learning, they actually became missionaries. So I would advise, this is my prayer to God. I would want to homeschool my children now. And if I'm to send my children to school, I'm hoping that I'll be able to send them to the Adventist school. 
because I realize that that's the most ideal for them, especially at this time. And if, I, if you are to move to a certain place, it's actually very important also to consider the education of your children in moving because you are not just living for yourself. You are living for your children as well. What will be their benefit? They are frail minds. They are still learning. How much are you going to commit in homeschooling them as well? Those things are very important. And as God says, we should just lay everything before, the, before God, but we should make progress as soon as God opens the door. But if they are little ones, let's try and homeschool them. That would be the most ideal. If there is no Adventist school just, by, just around by. Thank you. All right. I think Chiloda Kufa Senior also has a, has a question. What, did you forget to lower your hand? No, no. I, I, it's not a question. It's an input. Okay. Yeah. I'm not... I, I'm adding to what, mm -hmm. what, what you are. Yeah, I, I was also going to say, I think in the future presentation, we, we, I'm happy that you have addressed the uh, fight it in terms of hundred uh, things. But I think as as this, this is where we are lacking. We, we don't discuss equipping each other. How do we equip each other for going out there and, and being self-sustained. Because as, as we speak right now, we can say, let's go out of the country. I think the reason why people are a bit naive and scared to leave cities is they don't have, they don't know how to, they can't, can't produce when they go out of the cities. All they have are the qualifications. They have their bachelor's degrees, their master's degrees, their PhD. So they survive on their certificates. So they are basically in bondage. Because what, what, what should happen is we need to be employed by someone that we can survive. Mm -hmm. So I feel that, I strongly feel that in the future we also need to teach each other survival skills. How can we go and survive out of the cities? Yeah. Because you cannot get someone to live up the city without giving him a solution. When he gets out there, how does he survive? I, 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 I like that. There's a, there's a, I think there's a, there's a brother who actually asked this question to say, I don't know, I cannot, I've never done farming. How would I survive when I leave the city? I think these are some of the things that we need to discuss as Adventists. Because we, we are only bothered on the peripheries. We, we tell you that we need to go out of the cities. But are we addressing the real issues, the social issues? When someone goes out of town, how does he farm, for instance? How does he, you know, that, 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 I always wanted to add on one thing, as a group, we have a group that we started as, as, as Adventists at our at, at founded. Because we are a group of 15 people. But realize that mm -hmm. most, most of the people are not part of it. And when, when we start this group, the idea is, guys, let's come together. Let's start doing the farming here in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Show each other how this thing is done. But when we leave South Africa, eventually everyone will be grouped up. They will be having the knowledge yeah. to go and stay by themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm just going to add this to say, whilst we are preaching the gospel of country living, let's also equip each other on how to survive outside the city. That's mm -hmm. my contribution. Yeah, no, you are very practical, my brother, and I agree with you fully. Uh, many of us, uh, you know, no, I, I don't want to give this example, but what I want to say is this uh, if you don't have a skill, you'll be in problems. You just have to prepare. If you cannot produce even in your back garden a vegetable, you will not start when you go to the countryside. So I think it's very important. But the best way to teach people practical is that, you know, let's go and work in the garden. When we go into the work in the garden, then we understand the practicality of doing it. I've, uh, I've joined a group. The group is, uh, in fact, it's somebody joined me to a group of uh, farmers. It's, uh, the, these are goat farmers. They are in Bulilima. I think Bulilima somewhere, you know where Bulilima is. These are goat farmers. And uh, oh, in that forum, they teach one another how to breed the best goat. They teach one another how to treat the diseases of goats. They treat one another how the goat graze. In fact, they, they, they teach one another. There are a lot of lessons. And uh, I think about a week or so, or a few, few, I think they are advertising a seminar on how to breed these goats. 
they are teaching. It's actually, it's actually very practical. And I want to believe that, you know, as a church, we can come to a point where we can say, today we are going to have a lesson on sowing. We teach our women how to do sowing so that when we go into the countryside, we will not be making everything. And then probably we come together as men, we teach one another how to construct fencing so that you not hire everyone to do everything. In fact, God expects us to be industrious. You cannot be paying for every, everything. Somebody, eh, whenever your tire is, has a punch, you pay someone to do it. No, those things you can do them for yourself. And indeed, my brother, I agree fully. We are called to be practical. And indeed, let's actually do that as a matter of agents. I'll be very happy to join that lesson myself and begin to learn to do things. Of course, I'll also be contributing as somebody who has grown in the rural areas. Some of the things we have been taught as we're growing and we can do them. But uh, new skills is very important. Yes, anyone else? I can see it's three more minutes to go. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Brother Kibogora, for, for such a wonderful lesson. Uh, I believe as well the country living message is present truth, and there is no compromise, you know, along those lines of you know in, in terms of accepting that gospel. Uh, my question, uh, basically. Probably, I'd say, I would say two questions, if, if I will put them right. Uh, the country living message is very relevant to our time. But uh, when, at times when you bring it in the, in the context of the African perspective, uh, at times the, the dynamics do not fit solidly well. I, I, I will explain exactly yeah. what I'm trying to Mm -hmm. uh, bring it in, in the South African context where people are living in more of concentrated camps, locations where they are living kumkuku of some sort and such people are the audience of the message that you are carrying now and we want to put relevance to the message you are carrying so that we cannot you know, preach something that is beyond reach to the audience that you are preaching to. So, and also not ignoring the socio-economic dynamics of our African people. We grew up in the rural areas, yes, I agree. I heard someone saying, he comes from Shurugi, I come from Shurugi too. And the land, the soil type in Shurugi, believe you me, it has been cultivated so often that it is sandy. And people need to look for better land because the country living message has to deal with land first. People need land to do everything that you need to do in the country living. So if the land is poor, meaning to say you might have brilliant projects that might not be sustainable in Shurubi because the land needs fertilizer time and again and again. And so I'm, I'm just trying to, to find relevance in the message. The message is clear, the message is present truth, there is no two ways about it, but how to put it in the perspective of our African society. We are from a colonized people, that's our background. We have been pushed into certain settlements that are very unproductive. Right now the governments, for example South Africa, they are pushing for land, you know, getting back land without expropriation. What is the position of an Adventist in all that in trying to attain towards country living? My salary is just 10,000 rands a month. I need land, but my money is insufficient, it's not enough to acquire that. The how part that you talked about is how to, the how part and how to gel in the perspective. I think that's my question, to bring relevance, the message has to be relevant. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I think you have said quite a number of things and then of uh, some of the things you were answering what you were saying, which is actually very important. Now, uh, it's all in the preparation. If I'm going to move today, I've got my three kids and my wife here. I ask myself, where am I going? And then I say, I go to my father's home 
that's fine. There is a place, there is a land. The question is, what crops can I grow there? And then I say to myself, how much water do I have there? Will I survive without enough water? What can I do to have water? And then what should I do? I think these things are very important. There are crops which can grow in that soil which is so used. If the soil is so used, what do I need to add there? If I need to add manure, do I have access to that manure? Where can I get it? Or if the soil is so used, where can I go? Can I find somewhere? I think we cannot remove the equation of God aside. Now, the people that lived in what you call Inkoko, what you call... You mentioned a term which I cannot remember, but let me say in the slums, maybe probably, let me just say uh, for the sake of this presentation, I say in the slums, in the ghettos and slums. Now, when the children of God hear the message of God and they decide to obey God, God always opens the way for them. It doesn't matter where you are. When you have decided to move with God, God always opened the way. How relevant is this? In the African community, we believe in country living. Many of us, we don't even believe in city life. So the message is actually very much more relevant to us. We understand it better because that has been our life. But all what we need to do is this. We need to teach it at another level. As uh, Brother Shinoda Kufa was saying, the practicality, how, what are the things we are going to do, how productive we are going to be. I could give examples of people that were living in the countryside and they were more successful than people who were living in town. I wish I can be as successful as they were because they were very successful in the rural areas. They mastered the art of living in the country, in the rural area. And as the children of God, we are called to be heads, not the tails. All what we need to do is preparation. Let's make a timetable that at a certain time I should have done this. The land is so expensive, but I have got a quotation here that the land can be bought for, you can get actually land for free. You can get land for free. And I've actually said to God, I say to God, if I'm going to move from my father's homestead, God, you need to give me land for free. If you can't give me land for free, then uh, I don't have to leave that free land going anywhere. There is no point. Because I believe that God, my father, has left a land for me. And in that land, I, I believe that I can produce. I believe that I can do things. And I'm hoping that that will be my country home. In a very few months' time, I will be able to set up and begin to run my life as normal, as good as I'm doing while I'm in England. This is my uh, understanding and this is my hope I will be able to do that. And by God's grace, I should be successful in doing that. Yes, anybody who has something to say before I say the last words. <laughs> Can you hear me or I uh, or you've lost me now again? No, we haven't. Uh, I think I think that will be it, brother Chigo, but I don't see I don't see anyone with the question. Ah, that's good. So let me just say these last words then and then I'll pass over to you. And I want to thank you very much for allowing me to present to you for this one week. It was a blessing. As for me, I've benefited a lot. I've literally and really, really benefited. And I want to thank God for those who has facilitated this to happen, it's my, especially my family. This is something that we do with my family. We work together. I've got my children, wife, we work together. And our desire is to deliver praise and truth to the entire world. And I thank God for them every day and for allowing and making everything possible. And uh, as I've said, um, I, I've posted all these messages on my channel. You definitely have them on your channel as well. But the favor that you can do for me is just to subscribe to the Herald Report and to share these messages. And the more people subscribe, the more the messages share, the more the messages watch, the more the messages preach all over. And the coming of the Lord will be imminent. May the Lord sincerely bless you. May he guide you. May he strengthen you. May he uphold you with the right hand of mercy, with his right hand of mercy. I will pray and then I will hand over to you if that's okay. Shall I pray? Eternal Father of mercy and compassion, we have studied about the great controversy. We have studied about the war between evil and good. And we have realized that Lord Jesus, you keep your people. And we've realized that you come and take those who have done your will, you shall preserve them. And now we have been learning 
on the best place to live. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us. I plead sincerely that you pronounce a blessing upon the founding church. Bless their leadership. Bless their plans. Make their plans successful, dear Lord. If you allow us to open the churches, open the founding church and may you establish it. But above all, dear Lord, all my friends I've been talking to this afternoon and throughout this week, remember them in your kingdom of heaven. Strengthen them. There are those, Lord Jesus, who need help. Some have contacted me. Lord Jesus, I pray that you may meet them at their point of need. Thank you for all that you have done for us. And thank you for the blessing that we have received from you. And thank you for the program. In thee, Lord, we put all our trust. In thee, Lord, we depend. To you be the glory, power, strength, and everything. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. May the Lord bless you and bless you indeed. In Jesus' name, amen.